let's now consider late adulthood. What ages are associated with it? Take a moment and consider that question. There's Bailey, the rescue dog. Hopefully you said ages 60 to 65 until death. In the US, a typical adult will live nearly two healthy decades in their post-retirement years. Now having two decades of life post-retirement means these decades have to be funded. And remember, Social Security loan is not sufficient to meet basic expenses and certainly not to give a quality of life that the person enjoyed uh, while they were working. I remember the three legs of the retirement school, stool of pensions being one, but personal savings is the major leg of that stool. I don't know if you're familiar with the idea of long-term care insurance. The earlier you buy it, the cheaper it is. It's not a cheap insurance, but it would provide services to keep you in your home. So whether some people would be sent off to nursing facilities, uh, this would provide for people to come into your home uh, so you could stay in your home. If you do go, ahead, go to a nursing facility, it would get you higher quality and also preserve your finances much, much, much longer so that your children or whoever you want to receive it will actually get, receive it instead of the government taking it to pay for your costs. So I did purchase one and uh, it's a very good idea. Let's consider two important themes of entire life, but particularly of late adulthood. First one, use it or lose it. That applies to the brain, that applies to the body. Another theme, losses can be reversed. Pictured from your text is 82-year-old Emmestine Shepherd, who, as you might want to correctly guess, has won many bodybuilding contests for individuals her age. Very impressive, I think. break down the late adulthood into the three recognized groups of ages. Young old, which is 65 to 74. Old old, 75 to 84. And oldest old, 85 and up. Now of those, or for that matter, any age group in the U.S., what is the fastest growing? Well, it would be the oldest old, the 85 and older, these require the most assistance from family and society. Now focusing on the oldest old, the 85 plusers, how common is Alzheimer's? Approximately half of them have Alzheimer's. break down the late adulthood into the three recognized groups of ages. Young old, which is 65 to 74. Old old, 75 to 84. And oldest old, 85 and up. Now of those, or for that matter, any age group in the U.S., what is the fastest growing? Well, it would be the oldest old, the 85 and older, these require the most assistance from family and to society. Now focusing on the oldest old, the 85 plusers, how common is Alzheimer's? Approximately half of them have Alzheimer's. I should add, add on about Eileen Noble. Uh, she didn't begin running until age 50. And as the time I made the slide, she had participated in 19 marathons. So it's basically never too late to begin. Since we are considering functional age in terms of the running of the London Marathon, let's consider uh, Fayoja Singh. He gave up running the marathon at age 100. 
And by the way, this marathon is not a five mile or it would be probably K over there. It is 26 miles. Since we are considering functional age in terms of the running of the London Marathon, let's consider uh, Fayoja Singh. He gave up running the marathon at age 100. And by the way, this marathon is not a five mile or it would be probably K over there. It is 26 miles. I should add, add on about Eileen Noble. Uh, she didn't begin running until age 50. And as the time I made the slide, she had participated in 19 marathons. So it's basically never too late to begin. I thought it might be interesting for you to compare some of the longest lived animals. So take a look at the list here and rank them from uh, oldest living to uh, youngest living. Your choices are the Greenland shark, a picture there with a person swimming next to it, the bowhead whale, which is the longest lived of the whales, uh, humans, the clam known as the quahog, if I'm saying it right, cl clam, and we can't forget the tortoise. Uh, you can see a picture of uh, Jonathan the tortoise there as a youngster and uh, when this picture was taken in 2016. So go ahead and rank them and see where people compare on the list and how everything else compares to everything else. So the oldest known living animal is a particular quahog clam uh, that's 507 years old and you're wondering how can we possibly tell well they have rings like trees so they counted the rings now could there be other clams that have never been counted by people that are older certainly yes the oldest vertebrate animal would be the greenland shark the greenland shark can live to be at least the oldest one we encountered is almost 400 years old eight years shy of being 400. The oldest mammal would be the bowhead whale, uh, shown in one of the pictures on the slide. The bowhead, the we uh, where it's lived the longest, is a little over 200 years old by 11 years if you care, but a little over 200. Now, if you look at the tortoise there, uh, that's Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan is at this point 191 years and I did check uh, that's a 2024 number so Jonathan is still going strong humans well depending on who you want to believe uh, either 119 or 122 I would push you in the 119 uh, direction for uh, belief in terms of the oldest living human so hopefully you found that interesting next we have a little activity for the dog lovers looking at lifespan and I'm sorry if you're not a dog lover, it's uh, didn't do one for cat lovers. So if you could go to the attached website and look for the shortest lived breed and the longest lived breed, uh, both are pictured here. So take a peek. Next we have a little activity for the dog lovers looking at lifespan. And I'm sorry if you're not a dog lover, it's uh, didn't do one for cat lovers. So if you could go to the attached website and look for the shortest lived breed and the longest lived breed, uh, both are pictured here. So take a peek. Let's identify our players starting from the top row. A Brittany Spaniel, a Catalula Leopard Dog, Long Haired Chihuahuas, Afghan Hound, a pair of Ferocious Pit Bulls, a Pulley, and let's see, that's a Wolfhound, there's Scottish and Irish, and that's Scottish. In terms of from this list of dogs, the shortest uh, lived breed would be the Scottish Wolfhound, very large breed as you can see. The longest lived from this particular list was the Chihuahua. I will say though, in terms of outliers, the Skipper Key, a small black dog with a naturally bobbed tail, may not live as a group the longest, but it's not necessarily rare for one to exceed 20 years either. Hope you enjoyed this. I thought I'd add a picture of the world holder for being the world's oldest dog. You can see Bluey there. Uh, would you recognize the breed? And 
here to guess the gauge. The breed is called uh, Blue Healer or just a healer or Australian cattle dog, all the same. Uh, Bluey died at age 29, had to be euthanized. Worked, was still a working dog at age 20. Uh, and it, Bluey lived uh, long before uh, any of us were alive. Uh, died during the Great Depression. Some sources, such as our text, list Jean uh, Calament as the longest lived person in history, uh, surviving to supposedly 122 years. But there's some very nice scholarly works out there that suggest it was her daughter passing herself off as her mother that got her mother to this record. So we will not consider uh, Jean Calment as the longest lived person. Let's see who probably is. Assuming that you found the little chart a little unsatisfying because you couldn't see where the U.S. is ranked, even though I verbally indicated it. Uh, this chart is uh, maybe perhaps more to your liking. It's looking at uh, the OECD countries that we've looked at quite a bit. You can see what the average OECD country is in red there. That could be a quiz question, perhaps. And you can see the United States is quite a bit lower than the average. So I think it may be a very useful chart. Currently, the U.S. enjoys the rather dubious distinction of being the only industrialized nation to see a drop in this rating uh, for several years now. But before we leave this section of the uh, notes, could you consider possible reasons to explain why we are so incredibly low in this ranking in terms of healthy life expectancy? So let's start with diet. In some of the highest ranked countries, diets are very high in, not in animal-based proteins, but very high in plant-based calories. We are the reversed. Uh, countries that live a long number of years, such as South Korea and Japan, uh, eat far fewer processed foods. You also see a much higher rate of obesity and related health conditions in the US. What would be some of these related health conditions Take a moment and see how many we can think of. So you might have said diabetes, very good answer. Heart disease, heart attacks not only kill, they incapacitate and debilitate. Strokes, again, strokes don't always necessarily kill. They can also uh, incapacitate. Cancer as well, cancer is much more prevalent in individuals and cultures that have very poor diets, high fat, low plant. Drug use is also a significant factor. Lack of universal health care. We spend the most, but we have far from all people covered. Untreated mental health issues. Poverty related issues. Right now we're seeing a spreading of the economic well-being of the 1% versus the average person. So poverty and this gap is now widening terrifically. And discrimination related issues, some of the many reasons. So quite obviously, there's a difference in the number of years that one would expect for a healthy life expectancy in rich industrial nations versus the poor nations. What are some of the factors that influence uh, the healthy life expectancy? Poverty is a factor, but malnutrition can be a prominent factor. Preventable disease, this picture makes you uh, definitely consider the effect of contaminated water, amongst other issues. Pregnancy and birth-related issues. Again, in these countries, women often die earlier than men related to lethality in pregnancy and childbirth itself. Dangerous jobs. Clearly, no OSHA would be protecting the workers of this particular area. And even armed conflict. So let's look at some of the many factors that can be associated with longevity. They are both biological, psychological, and social. They all combine and interact. So with genetics, some people have longevity genes. In no small part, this is related to how long the end caps stay on the chromosomes, 
Can you remember the term for those end caps? Hopefully you said telomere and better immune systems so people don't die of regular flu or COVID or cancer. A good immune system destroys cancer cells before they destroy you. Health would include low substance use, high exercise, and the good diet. The personality trait of optimism. Optimism has a profound impact. People with cancer that are optimistic have a much higher rate of survival than people that are pessimistic. It also influences how well you do at school, how well you do at work, and general life. As much as you can, try to be optimistic. Activities such as stimulating work and also community involvement. Social, does that person have a social network of friends and family? All these factors are associated with longevity. Next, let's consider two important terms related to quality of life, ADLs and IADLs. ADLs, activity of daily living. The basic ability to take care of oneself, whether it's getting out of bed, uh, getting dressed, moving around your apartment, uh, eating, bathing, and so on. The IADLs, instrumental activities of daily living. This is beyond simple living. Uh, these require much greater cognitive ability. Basically, it's to navigate the environment of one's life. Shopping, paying bills, uh, making appointments with doctors, and so on. The next slide will consider the leading causes of death in late adulthood. Before you go to it, could you take a moment and see if you can predict as many as possible of these five leading causes? Take a moment and actually please do it. I read an article last year looking at factors associated with uh, prevention uh, of Alzheimer's, decreasing your risk, and one was actually housework. So look at women are much more inclined to be doing a lot of the housework than men in uh, uh, heterosexual couples, and assuming that they're both healthy, and that women often uh, are given a certain degree of protection that men aren't afforded because doing housework requires planning and organizing and et cetera, et cetera. It's actually good cognitively as well as physically. How well did you do? I suspect that you might have not considered chronic respiratory diseases. Uh, I definitely did. That's the condition that she took my mother. Let's consider aging of the senses, starting with hearing. Most people have a gradual unnoticeable hearing loss, pronounced presbycusis. I certainly have a certain degree of it. But how common is hearing loss well beyond this presbycusis? How common is severe loss? Well, 60, 75, about 25% of people, so one in four, so not uncommon. Severe loss at 75 and older is at least half of the people. This would be levels that would interrupt their daily and functioning and overall quality of life. Well, of the people that actually could benefit from hearing aids, what percent actually use hearing aids? Apparently only one third. Take a moment and consider why they aren't using hearing aids. Since I made this original narration, uh, over-the-counter hearing aids are now available as little as $100, though I might suspect uh, to get one that has features you like and is also the uh, help and service that you need might be considerably more, but many of them do have money-back guarantees. So that certainly opens up a new world of hearing uh, for older people. And I will say that uh, inability to hear is associated with an Alzheimer's risk, people that can't hear, uh, don't socialize, don't engage, and that's a major risk factor for Alzheimer's. Let's consider vision issues in late adulthood, both normal and pathological. Common issues would include issues with glare, dark adaption, distinguishing colors, and the irritating feeling of dry eyes. 
Now let's consider some of our conditions and their associated terms. Starting with presbyopia, that starts around 40, which would be in early adulthood. The lens of the eye starts to become rigid. As it stiffens, it is no longer able to focus the image correctly on the retina. This results in objects not being to be able to be seen distinctly, especially objects that are close up. So you often will see a person reading with perhaps the newspaper or the menu held at arm's length. Clearly this person has presbyopia. Their lens is not focusing image properly, so now they're compensating perhaps with extending their arms. Other conditions include cataracts. The eye is mostly composed of water and protein, and in cataracts, the proteins of the lens are starting to congeal. Visually, the person would have a hazy, bluish-gray uh, color inside the eye. You can do things to increase or decrease your risk. Smoking obviously increases risk. You probably can't do much about your genetics or diabetes. Uh, they are both risk factors, too. Though you can try to protect your eyes with UVI protection. How common is it? Fairly common. Consider 75 and older. Uh, conveniently, for students trying to learn the number, 75% of 75 and older people, people have cataracts. In a country such as ours, not a significant problem. Uh, simple eye surgery done not even under local, just with uh, an injection to the eye. Uh, the person walks out in a few hours with funky eyeglasses, good to go. But cataracts in many countries that are poor are not operated on and they're a major cause of blindness. And cataracts do actually appear in people of all ages, including children, adolescents, and young adults. So worldwide, cataracts are a major cause of blindness and a fixable cause. Let's consider next macular degeneration. It's degeneration of the macula. I know that was very helpful. The macula is the fovea, if you learn that term in intro psych. Uh, I don't teach it. The, the macula or the fovea is the most sensitive, accurate part of the retina. When you look, you always try to get the image focused on that particular part of the eye. And in macular degeneration, that macula, basically the best part of your retina, is starting to deteriorate. In part, it's due to a fatty protein buildup, and in part, it's due to thinning. Uh, risk factors, smoking, of course, and maybe you've got bad genetics. Let's consider glaucoma. Which one is glaucoma? Too much fluid inside the fluid chambers of the eye, called the humors. Uh, it's not a painful condition at all, but as the pressure increases, it starts to damage the retina. And when this happens, solely the person loses peripheral vision. What test at the eye doctor is for this? If you're thinking of that puff of air, yes, that puff of air is one of the tests used to detect glaucoma. Next, I think you'll enjoy uh, looking at the uh, next slide. On the upper left, there's a picture showing normal vision, and the three other pictures try to identify. One is of macular degeneration, one is glaucoma, and one is cataracts. Let's see how you do. If you're saying, didn't we do this slide before, you're absolutely right in the next slide too. So if you remember them, uh, skip it. But perhaps you still want to take the test on the next slide to make sure you do actually remember it. If you're saying, didn't we do this slide before, you're absolutely right in the next slide too. So if you remember them, uh, skip it. But perhaps you still want to take the test on the next slide to make sure you do actually remember it. So again, the picture in upper left is normal vision. What about the picture to the right of it, blurry? Did you say uh, cataracts? You're correct. Now going to the bottom left, the center where the eye wants to look is gone. The center would be the part that your fovea, that your macula would want to be involved in. So that would be macular degeneration. And on the right, you see the person has lost a lot of the peripheral part of the vision. That would be glaucoma. How did you do? So the leading cause of blindness is on the slide. Which one do you believe it is? If you think it's glaucoma, no, it would be cataracts. 
And although we think of cataracts with aged people or aged animals for that matter, uh, cataracts actually occur in young individuals too. And in poor countries, the developing countries where surgery is not affordable is a major cause of blindness. I love to gain, donate some of my spare change to some of these organizations because literally money gives sight. And it's a wonderful thing to do if you can afford to do so. Next, let's consider a family senses, sometimes called skin senses, somatic senses, or body senses. There are three of them. Do you know what they are? If you're thinking touch, temperature, and pain, you would be correct. We'll consider touch later. Right now, let's focus on pain and temperature. Do older people feel more or less pain? Actually, biologically, they feel less, which is usually but not always good. Pain does tell you that you're injured or have a, maybe an infection going, but they often have conditions that are chronic and are painful. Anywhere between half to three quarters of people in late adulthood have chronic pain issues. Sometimes opiates will have to be used. Opiates, as you know, have quite a few serious drawbacks. I know you know addiction, but they also cause uh, constipation, dry mouth, and drowsiness. This can all negatively impact the quality of the senior's life. Moving away from the pain issue, considering temperature. Temperature is both related to the skin and the functioning of your hypothalamus. Many elderly feel cold more severely this is in part due to decreased metabolism, maybe a side effect of medications, maybe related to anemia. Because the senior is less likely to read environmental stimuli properly, they do risk overheating. Moving on, let's consider the vestibular sense, our fancy term for sense of balance. The key structures are in the inner ear, and this structure does affect function far less efficiently with advanced age. But what brain structure do we say also plays a essential role in balance? If you're thinking hypothalamus, uh, no. How about cerebellum? I debated whether or not to include this last point, but decided I would. My father has been hospital in terms of pain and not being able to feel things. That includes bladder infections. Usually when a young person gets a bladder infection, they're painful. They know it. Seniors often are oblivious and have no pain. My father's been hospitalized three times, almost septic once. Most of my friends' parents have been hospitalized for bladder infections. So you really have to do as much as you can to harp on them, to drink, to, you know, maybe... I even resort to putting cups out so he can move cups from one side of the kitchen to the other as a mnemonic system. Uh, so it's a really big problem and it can actually result in death. Uh, other props are overheating. Uh, when the Euro Europe in 2019 had that hot stretch, uh, over 30,000 people died and they were mostly seniors. They were unable, their bodies were unable to respond to the overheating uh, conditions. They're also more likely to have uh, underheating or hypothermia due to everything from metabolism to less fat to anemia. So all these are significant uh, issues for individuals in late adulthood. You might remember from intro psych that the cerebellum would be the two balls at the base of the brain. Lastly, let's consider the chemical senses. These would be your olfactory and gustatory senses. In other words, smell and taste, highly related. Basically, you're smelling bits of chemicals in the air or tasting bits of chemicals upon your tongue. When people get to the 85 and older age, half have no ability to smell or taste whatsoever. The next slide will consider implications. Before you go to the next slide, I'd ask you to take a look at all these senses that we've discussed, and we have not discussed all, but take a look at the senses we've discussed and see how their change in functioning might have day-to-day -day implications in the person's ability to do the daily activities of living and, indeed, their overall quality of life.
I debated whether or not to include this last point, but decided I would. My father has been hospital in terms of pain and not being able to feel things. That includes bladder infections. Usually when a young person gets a bladder infection, they're painful. They know it. Seniors often are oblivious and have no pain. My ho father's been hospitalized three times, almost septic once. Most of my friends' parents have been hospitalized for bladder infections. So you really have to do as much as you can to harp on them, to drink, to, you know, maybe I've even resorted to putting cups out so he can move cups from one side of the kitchen to the other as a mnemonic system. Uh, so it's a really big problem and it can actually result in death. Uh, other props are overheating. Uh, when the U Europe in 2019 had that hot stretch, uh, over 30,000 people died, and they were mostly seniors. They were unable; their bodies were unable to respond to the overheating uh, conditions. They're also more likely to have uh, underheating or hypothermia due to everything from metabolism to less fat to anemia. So, all these are significant uh, issues for individuals in late adulthood. Let's start with vision. Poor vision can mean the person will have trouble driving, either leading to the loss of activities and independence, or sometimes a person driving that has no right to be on the road. Lack of driving can make it difficult to see friends, to get together with and do activities. It can also pose significant problems in daily living, such as perhaps reading one's medication. Reading will become difficult. Maybe a special eyewear will be needed or large edition books or audiobooks. Many hobbies require very good vision. Next, let's consider the chemical senses. Since trouble with smell and taste, the person might over salt, particularly problematic with people with high blood pressure. Or the person doesn't enjoy eating, uh, so won't buy high quality food, or won't bother to pay for eating out with one's friends because you really can't taste it. If you can't smell, think of the implications you can't smell. You can't smell if a stove is left on. Uh, you might not be aware that you yourself smell or that you're using too much cologne or too much perfume. Let's consider somatic issues. Well, if there's issues with touch, could be troubles with the ADLs. Pain, uh, the person its inability to recognize it may lead to missing warning signs of an infection or an injury. Temperature, they may keep their home entirely too hot for others. I have a friend right now that's a busy nurse and she's fully garbed in plastic and she's going to homes that are 90 degrees and having quite a bit of difficulty. With the risk of overheating, it's particularly problematic in homes that do not have air conditioning. Most American homes do, but Air conditions in Europe are fairly uncommon, most typically found at hotels in which foreigners visit. In 2019, the European heat wave killed 30,000 plus seniors. Uh, issues with the vestibular sense? Well, less balance means maybe less willing to walk, less willingness to go outside in general, withdrawing, uh, trouble with balance leading to falls. We know that exercise is important at any age and that probably most of us don't get enough. But if it's important for children or adolescents or young adults or middle-aged adults, it's even more important to people in late adulthood. It is the single leading contributor to longevity. Benefits, so many. Physically, uh, balance, energy, bone health, heart health, and muscle mass. You might not be so up on muscle mass until you read your textbook and learned about sarcopenia. This would be the loss of muscle mass as a part of aging. Some experts say it begins in our uh, third decade, in our 30s, at 3 to 5 percent a year. So from 30 to 70, a conservative estimate would be a 12 percent loss if you're a uh, lighter exerciser, less physically active in life, you could lose 5%, which could be a 20% loss of muscle mass. This makes seniors uh, less energy, poor balance, less, just prone to so many issues. Of course, exercise not only has physical benefits, it has distinct cognitive benefits, thinking, memory, 
and even mood. Yet, many seniors are not active at all. Maybe going from living room table to couch to living room table to bathroom to couch. And that might be their entire exercise, a few back and forth the entire day. I've seen this in one of my own friends. Uh, it did lead to a fall and didn't get up accident. Uh, ironically, I called the check on her and left her a message suggesting that she get an emer emergency medical alert device. And she was lying on the floor at that point, unable to get up and spent two days there. Uh, one, one more of that story might be, if you know any seniors in your life, uh, make sure they have the device or have somebody calling them daily. She now has the device, and after that, I started calling my aunt every day. Lack of physical exercise, we know, leads to cognitive loss, falls, mobility loss, and the loss of independence. So the, the risks are huge for them not being physically active. Let's now consider sexual activity in seniors. I thought it'd be a nice transition to go from the exercise slide into the sexual activity slide. So if you were to ask to summarize this particular chart for 65 to 74 year olds and then 75 to 85, what might you say? Well, what jump out at me is that people in the first half of late adulthood Almost three quarters of them are having sex, at least occasionally, so that they are sexually active. That three quarter number, okay, I did a little rounding up, but that three quarter number, I think would surprise most people. If you consider people in the second half of late adulthood, well, it now changes to about 50%. Again, we're doing a little rounding up. Again, I think that would surprise most people. So maybe we're fighting a stereotype here. I hope so. In the middle adulthood chapter, we began our discussion of osteoporosis. Now we will continue it. We know that there's a strong need to strengthen bones when young. And also to avoid risk factors. You did a quiz earlier on risk factor assessment. Osteoporosis is a significant risk for both hip and spine fractures. One in three elderly people who have a hip fracture will die within that subsequent year. Remember, it requires surgery, anesthesia, the risk of infections, the risk of blood clots, the risk of being in a hospital. In the best of circumstances, it's a major disruption of life. A rehab facility would be needed. Many times they cannot return to their own home. Let's now consider arthritis. Arthritis has two varieties. First, we'll discuss osteoarthritis. This is where the cartilage in your joints becomes worn, often related to wear and tear. This is a very limited form. It's not throughout the body. For example, a person might have two bad knees or even one bad knee, and that's it. Rheumatoid arthritis is a much more devastating condition. It's an inflammatory response. The immune system is actually attacking the body and thus it involves the whole body. Let's now focus on decline in heart, in other words, cardiac, and respiratory, in other words, pulmonary systems. The heart is going to beat less effectively, so there'll be less blood flow. That's gonna have significant effects on energy level, amongst other things. The lung capacity is now decreased by half, again, less energy. There's also a significant decline in the immune system, so infections cannot be fought, such as the flu or COVID-19. Three-quarter of flu deaths are those people in late adulthood. As we're seeing now in COVID, the majority of people that are dying are either uh, seniors or people that are compromised that are younger. But despite this need, one-third of the elderly don't get a flu shot. We should also say the immune system not only fights bacteria and viruses, another major job is to cruise around the body looking for cells that are becoming abnormal, that are precancerous, or even cancerous, knocking them out before they knock, knock us out. Uh, this is one reason why elderly have an increased rate of most cancers. Unfortunately, the immune system is underactive in some areas, 
and overactive in others. So autoimmune conditions like arthritis is when the body is overactive and now targeting its own tissue instead of the foreign invader or the homegrown cancer terrorist. Let's consider diabetes. What percentage of seniors? At least 25% are fully diabetic. The issue? Too little insulin being produced by, hmm, what gland would that be? Hopefully you said the pancreas. This high glucose damages much of the body. It can damage the heart. It can damage the eyes, leading to diabetic retinopathy, a type of blindness that we didn't discuss. Kidney damage, to the extent that dialysis might be required. Nerve damage, uh, causing extreme nerve pain. And brain issues, for example, increased risk of stroke. Obesity is a huge risk. And often diabetes can be reversed in the early stages, sometimes just by weight loss and diet accommodations. I want to add the concept of delirium to the slide. Delirium is a temporary state. The person is uh, confused, maybe uh, aggressive, uh, rambling, distressed. It's seen in seniors, uh, for example, if they go into a hospital, you can see in that, or maybe the first day or first few days in a nursing home, you can see that. You can see it also in younger people that have severe illness burden, like burn victims, you often see that. So delirium might develop into a dementia, but more often than not, delirium can be abated. We also noted in the bottom there that uh, some conditions mimic NCDs. Delirium is one of them, but you can see that there are other conditions that can also mimic uh, severe uh, NCDs as well. Let's focus on Alzheimer's now, the most common cause of dementia. Half the people that are 80, 85 or older, in other words, the oldest old, have Alzheimer's specifically. Uh, is it treatable? Absolutely. There was a new medication approved less than six months ago. Uh, on general, the medications, if they're given early, can give the person three more years of high quality life. And three years is a lot. Three years can be a lifetime. What neurons are dying? Do you remember from intro psych? And what's the memory structure of the brain, the memory maker? Perhaps you remember discussing in intro acetylcholine. Those are the neurons that are dying. And the brain structure, I gave my students the mnemonic of hippocampus, the lost hippo on the college campus. So the hippocampus is taking a terrible beating. Is it a leading cause of American death? Uh, yes, it's in the top 10. Other dementias, uh, Alzheimer's is not the only one. Parkinson's co commonly causes dementia. Louis, du Louis body dementia, you probably have not heard of that one. Uh, Louis body dementia is associated with uh, the famous person, it would be uh, Robin Williams had Louis body. You might have not heard of also frontotemporal lobar dementia. That's what Bruce Willis has. So there are other dementias. There's also HIV caused dementia. Uh, you won't be responsible for those other dementias. Uh, you should know that Parkinson's is another common dementia and that in the future it might be preventable because apparently it's all, it's apparently caused by environmental toxins. So if we can avoid and minimize, perhaps uh, Parkinson's is the most likely one to be eliminated. You probably associate Parkinson's with um, Michael J. Fox and Muhammad Ali. You probably don't think about Parkinson's being a, a, a neurocognitive disorder, a dementia, but the majority of people with Parkinson's will go on to have dementia. With that being said, I'm not going to ask you information on the other dementia on your test. I actually took out a whole slide, so I'm sure you're happy about that. From childhood on, but more so in adolescents and older, depression is common, so common that it's called the common cold of mental illness. But let's consider depression in later life. Depression can be either caused uh, by just malfunctioning of the brain's uh, machinery, if you want to call it that, that's endogenous. Other times there can be a trigger event. 
we can call that type exogenous or reactive. Let's now consider some of the factors that are associated with later adulthood, loss of job identity. If you, your job was part of who you are and you no longer have it, you've lost a bit of you. Uh, retirement is better when it's voluntary, that's when by force, by either policies of the government, the business, or maybe ill health or mental decline. Loss of important roles that could be certainly the job role, but could be other things such as for a woman if she's been the caretaker, for that matter if it's been a man who's been the caretaker of an elderly parent and the parent dies uh, and so on. So loss of significant roles. Chronic diseases, much more common in late adulthood. Chronic pain, also much more common in late adulthood. Physical decline, also more common in late adulthood. Perceived bad health, so not actual bad health, but if the person perceives themselves as being unhealthy, that's also bad. Lack of control. Think of some of the common areas where they lose control. My father recently had to stop driving, so loss of driving. Uh, they might have had to sign away their uh, financial ability to care for themselves. Maybe they've been scammed by a, a uh, one of those uh, grandpa or grandma senior scams or many senior scams. So lack of control in their life. Maybe they've been told that they can no longer live in their home. Uh, social isolation. Think of some of the causes of social isolation. There's quite a few. Loss of hearing. Uh, you can't communicate with your friends easily. Uh, moving. Maybe your friends have moved to Florida or you've moved to Florida, what have you. The death of friends. Uh, loss of partner or friends due to dementia and so on. So social losses, social isolation. Let's look at possible protective uh, factors that can lower your risk of Alzheimer's. Now, that being said, you can have every single one of these and develop Alzheimer's, have none of them, and still get it. But all in all, a protection is a protection. Uh, taking anti-inflammatories, this would include aspirin and uh, naproxen, Aleve and the like. Apparently not the Tylenol-like drugs, so avoiding obesity. Obese people have a 20% increased risk. Mental stimulation. Take a moment and think what mental stimulation might include. Most people think of puzzles, Sudoku, or otherwise. True. It could be playing cards with friends. It could be playing Scrabble with friends. It could be uh, various uh, shared online games with friends. Uh, you might be surprised in the next slide, a couple things that you might not think mental stimulation. Talking politics with friends, but my advice is only if they share similar viewpoints. If not, you're likely to lose the friend, especially in today's climate, but mental stimulation. Education, which could be as obviously part of mental stimulation. So once you are retirement age, you can take many college courses for free. I have two senior auditors right now. They're very welcome. Vitamins. Uh, not smoking and or avoiding heavy drinking anyway. Exercise, note the three exclamation points. Avoid nighttime labeled products. And the next slide is some of the new cutting edge things I thought I would share with you. Oh, by the way, the picture is a normal brain on the right. See all the activity, see the size, see the small holes, ventricles. The brain on the left from the same size, should have been the same size brain. See far less activity, the huge ventricles, uh, the diminished sides, all signs of the brain is being ravaged by Alzheimer's. Take a look at these 10 signs of diabetes and consider how many you would actually recognize. Many people would recognize increased thirst slash urination and slow wound healing. Perhaps the tingling in the hands and feet. We've seen probably commercials on the neuropathy. But other features, headaches, blurry vision, increased appetite, probably less so. Some of these are caused by increased blood sugar, such as the increased thirst and urination and excessive fatigue. 
Others are caused by uh, nerve damage, such as the tingling in the hands and feet. Uh, some are caused by poor circulation. So a variety, of the, and some are caused by fluctuation of up and down. So interesting that it can have uh, opposite effects can cause these different symptoms. But again, be aware that you might, if you see them in a, perhaps an older family member or a parent uh, in particular, uh, be thinking of potential signs of diabetes.